Good afternoon and welcome to the 97th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of Drexel University, Philadelphia. Today, I talk about COVID-19, the government response and the future of democracy with Niles Gilman of the Bergeron Institute. You can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and suggestions for future guests and future topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, August 4th, 2020, there are 18,364,694 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. That's up from 18,139,438 cases reported yesterday. Of those, 4,742,277 are in the United States. That's up from 4,682,461 reported yesterday. There are now a total of 156,133 deaths reported in the United States from COVID-19. That is up from a total of 156,133 deaths reported in the United States, up from 154,992 reported yesterday. So still moving at the pace of over 1,000 deaths a day. As a some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for COVID-19 sufferers every day, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is prominent Congolese lawyer falls victim to COVID-19. Human rights defender Joseph Mukendi is aged 73. This is written by Karina Dikiefu Banona of Human Rights Watch. <clears throat> the human rights community in the Democratic Republic of Congo mourns the passing of one of its most respected figures. Lawyer John Joseph Mukendi Wa Malumba succumbed to COVID-19 on March 24th Kinshasa, the third person known to have died from the virus in the country. Mukindi's family, colleagues, and those he defended will sorely miss him. Throughout his career, Mukindi tirelessly advocated for the rights of the voiceless and the oppressed. He played a prominent role in the trial following the double murder of human rights defender Floribert Chibea and his driver Fidele Banzana in 2010. He fought passionately to defend their cause, Chibea's widow Annie said over the phone. He supported us immensely with his whole team of lawyers fighting for us during the trial. I have no words, it's really a shock. Many of the country's human rights and pro-democracy activists, as well as former members of the political opposition, remember how Mukindi fearlessly defended them when they were thrown behind bars during then President Joseph Kabila's final years in office. At the height of the political repression, Mukende successfully represented Fred Bauma and E. Akambla of the youth movement struggle for change at the Supreme Court of Justice, securing their release after 18 months in prison. He was there when we were going through this, when we really had no hope, Makambla told Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch could count on Mukende's sound advice whenever they needed him. He would always make time for them answering their questions, informing about ongoing cases, or simply sharing his thoughts and reflections on human rights and the political situation in the Congo. Born in Bonkonde in the Kasai Central Province, Mukende also served as president of the bar at the Court of Cassation. In 2018, Mukende was elected as member of the National Parliament for the Union for Democracy and Social Progress Party. Mukendi's legacy will continue to inspire lawyers and human rights activists, according to Human Rights Watch, in Congo to defend those targeted for their activism or political beliefs, no matter how challenging the circumstances. Okay, I'd like to turn to the conversation for today. Let me introduce my guest, 
Dr. Niles Gilman is the Vice President of Programs at the Berggruen Institute, in which capacity he leads the Institute's research program, directs its resident fellowship program, and is also deputy editor of Noema Magazine. He has previously worked as Associate Chancellor at the University of California, Berkeley. Gilman has won the Sydney Award for Long Form Journalism from the New York Times and an Ivy Award for National Political Economy from the Wall Post. He is the author of Mandarins of the Future, Modernization Theory in Cold War America, which appeared in 2004, and Globalization, Black Economy in the 21st Century, which appeared in 2011, as well as numerous articles on intellectual history and political economy, Bachelor of History at the University of California at Berkeley. Niles, welcome, and thank you so much for making time to come on COVID Calls today. Thank you for having me, Scott. I'd like to remind everybody you can get your questions in. You just have to put them into the YouTube live chat and we will get those throughout the day. You can also put them up on Twitter. Just be sure to tag at US of Disaster or you can email them to me directly, sgk23 at drexel.edu. And we are um, here on the East Coast fighting the uh, aftermath of the hurricane, a tropical storm moving through. So there's some significant wind and maybe interruption with the internet. Just want to let people know that ahead of time. We will work hard to still bring you this conversation. We might have to go off video at some point, but hopefully not. So you let me know if it gets a bit laggy on your side and you need me to repeat anything or if you need me to go off camera, okay? All right, so um, great. I've been looking forward to this. And I'd like to start just um, the way that I usually do, just find out where you're calling in from and what the pandemic situation is. Yeah, so I'm, I'm in San Francisco at, at the moment. Um, I've been down to Los Angeles a couple of times. Uh, I've driven to Los Angeles a couple of times during the pandemic of the last four, five months. Um, but most of the time I've been spending in San Francisco. Uh, you know, San Francisco was one of the first places in the country, the Bay Area, I should say, was one of the first places in the country to institute a lockdown. And uh, I think that stood us in good stead to begin with. I mean, I think we had a, we flattened the curve really quickly. Uh, we had some of the earliest cases in the country, really decisive action on the part of uh, the mayors here in the Bay Area and then the governor. Um, and that really slowed down the, the initial wave um, of, of infections. It's also true that the infections were from what appears to be the less lethal Asian strain of the virus, as opposed to the European strain that more infected the East Coast initially. Um, so things that in the first few months, California was doing obviously much better than New York, but much better really than the whole East Coast. In the last month or so, though, month and a half, um, things have gotten significantly worse again. You know, California, like a lot of other places in the country, tried to do the dance of reopening in late May, early June. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of people moving outdoors. There was not complete masking going on. And so the su unsurprising result is that we now have seen a, a return of a quite dramatic amount of um, new infections in California. The healthcare systems don't appear to be close to being overloaded as appears to be about to happen in some other states or at risk of happening in some other states. Uh, but certainly we are seeing an increase in cases and an increase in the death and fatality rate, uh, not the fatality rate, but the fatalities, the total fatalities here in, in California in the last few weeks. Has the governor been reluctant to go back to some of the measures that you had in place in March and April? It's been hard for me to well, understand well, I think, you know, obviously nobody wants to order everybody to stay home. I mean, that's a terrible thing to do. Um, but I, I wouldn't say he's been reluctant. He's certainly not been refusing to, to, to countenance or consider it. Um, you know, the school districts have all said that the kids are not going to not going to go back to school um, in the fall. Uh you know, so I think that, you know, people here are trying to do, be as serious as they can about it. But the, the fact of the matter is there's a huge amount of the virus is out there in the wild. And in my estimation, until if and when we get a vaccine, it's going to be very hard to do anything that involves mass gatherings, whether that's, you know, work functions, entertainment, school, et cetera. Um, you know, some of the universities haven't yet said they're not going to do in-person classes in the fall. But I think that that's just a matter of time. My colleagues at Berkeley thinks that that you know basically as soon as the students have all enrolled, <laughs> they're going to uh, they're probably going to announce that the classes yeah. are going to be done remotely. 
Uh, I had a conversation with Adam Rogers from Wired Magazine way back in March. And, um, you know, it's been, it was so interesting to talk to him because, as you said, the Bay Area and I guess Seattle were so far ahead of the rest of the country that even talking to him, I was didn't quite take it in at the time, but I was getting a preview of where we were going to be in New Jersey just two weeks after that. And I'm really worried that what you're describing right now is also the preview of where we're going to be uh, two to four weeks from now, because people here in Jersey have been, I think, very um, really trying to play by the rules and mask and not go outdoors. But as the summer grinds on, I can see that fatigue setting in and people want yeah. to get out and about. Yeah, no, and it's, it, you know, that's a, that's a very human reaction. Um, and the truth is, you know, if we had a really proper testing protocol, then we could put in play, place a test, trace, and isolate protocol. But, you know, we've been lagging on the testing side. Um, and I just don't know that Americans are willing to put up with the kinds of personal restrictions that a truly rigorous test, trace, and isolate protocol, as has worked in some other countries, particularly in East Asia, um, is, is likely to work. I mean, I just don't, I think it's against our culture. You know, I, I did an interview in a podcast with the former um, prime minister of Taiwan back in April. And I asked him, you know, Taiwan had their first case the same day we did. They are even more tightly connected to China. You know, a thousand flights a week were going between Taiwan and China before the COVID outbreak happened. And, um, you know, he went through all the things that they've done, which we can get into in some detail if you'd like, uh, that made them successful. They've had a, a grand total of seven deaths um, as compared to 157,000 or whatever the number is here in the United States. I mean, so it's it's five orders of magnitude, six orders of magnitude more effective response. And I asked him after he'd gone through, you know, the detailed reasons why Taiwan has had this relative success, whether there are lessons for the United States. And, you know, this is a man who got a PhD in political science from Yale University. He's, you know, knows the United States very well. Um, and he sort of shrugged his shoulders and said, well, I don't think so, because I just think that the way in which the United States is, for better, and in this case, for worse, just makes it impossible for you all to emulate what we've done. So you're just going to have to have a different approach to managing it than, than the one that we have here in Taiwan. So I'm not too optimistic. I mean, you know, like everybody else, I'm hoping there's going to be a vaccine soon. Um, but, you know, probably yeah. the best case scenario is that we're six months away from a vaccine five, six months away from a vaccine. And then we've got to ramp up production and we've got to figure out how we're going to distribute it. And that'll become a culture war unto itself as to who, you know, what order people get them in. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm not very happy about the prospect of how this is going to go, to be honest with you. Well, you've been very busy thinking about and writing about this, especially in this transnational perspective. And I want to talk about that and what also may happen as the election convergence is coming. And I want to get to all of that. And before we do, I just want to get a little of the backstory, um, you know, sort of your intellectual trajectory, how you find yourself at the Bergruen Institute. Now, what are some of the consistent questions that still kind of, you know, keep you up at, at night? And because I've been talking with so many people now over these months who don't necessarily, when I say I talk to disaster experts, they're like, am I a disaster expert? I'm like, well, you are now. There's just <laughs> right. lots of streams into it. And yours is, I think, an interesting one. Can you tell us a little bit about the background? And I also was kind of dying to hear about how you came up with Mandarins of the Future and, and, and that project, this important project. Sure. So, so my first book, Mandarins of the Future, started out as my dissertation uh, 25 years ago, actually. I was you know, coming in the middle of the 90s and trying to figure out what I wanted to write my history PhD in. Um, and uh, you know, I'd always been interested in, in the history of economic development, history of demography. Um, but my field that I was in was intellectual history. Now, you know, most traditional intellectual history mostly focuses on philosophers and artists and people who are sort of um, classic, you know, idea people. Um, there was just beginning to be some study of the history of the social sciences. Um, that was really a field that was beginning to emerge in the 80s. Um, and so I became interested in that. And I was particularly interested in the influence of social science on policy, on policy making. Um, and, and so I came to this idea of writing an intellectual history of modernization theory, partly because modernization theory, when I first read about it, struck me as a kind of a preposterous meta-historical theory about the way the world works. I mean, briefly, modernization theory posits that there's a 
you know, a template uh, of how you become a modern country that uh, was first sort of limbed, first outlined by the Brits and the Americans in the 18th and 19th centuries, and then was copied by people all over the world, and that the solution to development is for other countries to emulate the model of development that was pioneered by the original United States and British examples. Um, mm. This just struck me as an amazingly naive idea. I didn't, when I first was introduced to it, uh, my last year of college actually, I was like, how could the people have ever believed this? And it was just 30 years ago that this was sort of the gospel and was actually the basis for the major third world policies of the 1960s under President uh, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. And in fact, you know, the architect of modernization theory, probably the leading intellectual was a guy named Walt Rostow, who went on to become the national security advisor for, uh, you know, first was a head of policy planning at the State Department under, under Kennedy, and then became the national security advisor under Lyndon Johnson. It was the, one of the chief architects of the strategy behind the Vietnam War. Um, and so I was interested in sort of what's the intellectual history background of where this came from. Um, and, uh, and so that really was the book that I wrote. Now, at the time, I, I thought that the ideas were dead uh, and that they weren't going to come back. I mean, there was a little bit of a revival around Frank mm -hmm. Fukuyama and the end of history, but I didn't think this was a really serious mm -hmm. thing. And then as I was, you know, I finished the, the dissertation in 2000, I went into software and we can get into that in a second. Um, you know, it was the Bay Area, it was the 1990s and anybody could get a job in, you know, the dot-com era. Um, and... Uh, but you know, as I was finishing up and turning the dissertation into a book, of course, the invasion of Iraq happened. And the way in which the invasion, invasion of Iraq was justified, well, on the one hand, there were many justifications for the invasion of Iraq that were trotted forward. Obviously, there was you know, the fears that you know, Saddam might have a WMD program. That turned out to be not true. But the positive program uh, that Condoleezza Rice outlined in the National Security Strategy of 2002 was a vision of going to the global south um, and and introducing a program of modernization, uh, that the way in which the transformation of the Middle East was going to take place was through, you know, basically imposing the same kinds of systems that we have that has made our modernity so successful on countries across the Middle East. And the reason why we would be greeted as liberators, uh, as, uh, as, you know, um, Dick Cheney famously said would happen in Iraq, uh, was because we had this blueprint for modernity that every right thinking person in the world ought to want to emulate. Um, and so when the book finally came out in 2004, early 2004, it was just six months or nine months after the invasion of Iraq had taken place and the insurgency had already gotten started. And people became interested in the book, I think, partly because it was seen as kind of the intellectual prehistory of the kind of thinking that had led us into Iraq. Um, and so I think a lot of the reasons why people have read the book over the, of course, I had no idea when I was writing the book that that was going to happen. I mean, I can't take any credit for that. But I think, you know, insofar as people have become interested in the book, it's partly because it, it helps, I think, set the broader intellectual context for how we ended up, you know, in the quagmire of Iraq in the, in the, in the first decade of this century. Um, that timing is, that, that timing is interesting the way you describe it. And I, you know, you hit that moment also where, there were a lot of people studying the Cold War in terms of urban planning, who were right. looking at Cold War in terms of civil defense. With work, just as you described it, it's like, well, maybe we're almost at the end of this historiography. We don't know, it, it, especially if we bought into Fukuyama a little bit into that. But, you know, it's like some of those issues may be sort of settled. And 9-11 opened them all up again. In, totally in a un hugely unexpected way, we should have all seen coming that Dick Cheney was steeped in that Walt Rostow world. I mean, they all came out of that Absolutely. world. And That's I, right. I, I, yeah, I, they, I, they all, they all I, came out of that under, world. And, yeah. Right, and, and yeah. Condi Rice, you know, I mean, Condi Rice uh, got her PhD from the University of Denver in 1975. And the thing she wrote about was modernization theory. The thing that Newt Gingrich wrote his dissertation about in the early 1970s was modernization in Congo, in his case. So, you know, this was pervasive and it wasn't, you know, it was in, in every field in the social sciences. This was bought into in one way or another, uh, you know, economics, sociology, political science, even, you know, even history. You know, there were there were versions of this that were uh, promoted across the social sciences. And even though by the 1970s and 80s, as a theory, it was largely rejected and debunked officially. 
it still was the sort of background radiation ideology of how people thought about what development is and how it should happen, right? So even right. though it had been formally right. debunked, it was still, it hadn't been replaced with anything. And the reason why it hadn't been replaced with anything is because it, it represents a kind of a beautiful dream, right? The, the dream of modernization theory is, is incredibly appealing to a certain kind of small L liberal that likes to imagine the United States is a shining city mm -hmm. on a hill that can become an yeah. example that others can emulate. This it, it, so it totally appeals to American exceptionalism and believes that, you know, and it appeals to a certain kind of intellectual elite, says that the intellectual elites are the ones who lead the, the process of modernization. That's where the title of the book comes from, The Mandarins of the Future, because one of the modernization theorists I wrote about used that word to describe what, you know, what social scientists should be doing. They should be training the Mandarin elites of the future. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so you know, and of course it ended in a disaster, right? It ended in, a, and the reason, part of the reason why it was debunked in theory was because it ended, you know, it, it was seen, widely seen and correctly seen as being one of the ways in which we were led into Vietnam, which, you know, even now most people would consider to be uh, a pretty much unmitigated disaster for the country. And so I, I became interested in the ways in which the promises of utopia mm. can very easily lead us into mm. disasters, partly because it blinkers us to the unintended consequences of the, you know, of the endeavors of mankind, right? Um, so I, I've been on that beat for a long time. Uh, you know, my second book uh, was on deviant globalization. And it was in this, in a way, it was a sequel to Mandarins of the Future in the sense that what I want to know is what happens in countries where the dream of modernization dies and fails, right? Um, and part of this came out of looking at places like, you know, that had been the paragons of modernization theory and, and modernizing practices, right? You looked at places like Nigeria or, Mexico, right? And you look at the places that were the most dysfunctional by around, you know, the early decade, the early years of the 21st century. And it was often exactly the same places in these countries that had been the central sites of the modernization projects 20, 30, 40 years earlier. And what I discovered is I then was interested in what, what do these people do, right? And the answer is they're now plugged into a global network. And sometimes, you know, if the maquilladoras worked, then they, then they successfully modernized. Right, that happened in Korea, um, but in places where they failed, you now have people who are no—they're no longer peasants. They are urbanized. They are plugged into global networks, and they figure out other things to do, like smuggling, black markets, drugs, human beings, and you know, wildlife. I mean, any number of things can become the source of you know illicit commerce. And uh, and then you know, I was interested in how that works and how the the, the, the networks of globalization um, also become the pathways for bad actors to put bad things through those same pathways. So it's not just global goods that flow through the pathways of globalization, it's also global bads. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, that was then connected to the work I was doing at the time as a management consultant. I was working you know, with a lot of uh, you know, clients in Washington, DC, thinking about you know, long range um, security challenges uh, ranging from things like climate change, uh, to you know, the future of the war on drugs, to the possibility of an emerging rivalry with China, to state failures in places like Yemen or Libya. I mean, these were all projects that I worked on. And you know, those when you work on those kinds of projects, I mean, every one of those is either a disaster that's happening, or a disaster, in, or a potential disaster that you're trying to avert. So I, uh, I guess that's where I really started to really get into disasters. Um, and I did that for seven years, and then I, you know left that and went back to Berkeley um, uh, as an administrator, working as a chief of staff to the chancellor there. Um, and I'm not gonna say I presided over a disaster there, although we can get into the future of the universities because that may be a disaster in the making we'll, coming too. We'll work. Um, we'll work and now to, that I'm at yeah. the Gruen, it's a, it's a different thing altogether. I don't really work on disasters. I'm trying to work on prophylactic measures to prevent disasters from happening. So how do we fix our democracy, which is obviously creaking. It's not a disaster yet, but it might become a disaster if we don't fix it pretty soon. How do we fix capitalism? Capitalism is great at generating wealth, but it you know creates untold environmental externalities and creates huge amounts of inequality, which in turn mess with our democracy. So we've got to fix capitalism too. Um, how do we make sure that we can cooperate on a planetary basis despite growing geopolitical rivalries? You know, obviously the US and China, the West and China are, are you know, in a process of you know, pretty serious ideological uh, you know, divergence and conflict. And yet we have certain common problems that are not going to pay attention to whether we have an ideological conflict over human rights or over 
you know, which 5G platform is going to be deployed in which country. I mean, global warming is continuing without a regard for those kinds of petty human concerns. And so we need to figure out ways that we can collaborate, uh, even with people who we may have a lot of deep disagreements about on all sorts of levels. So those are the kinds of projects we're working on now at Begruen. That's great. Thank you for sketching out that that trajectory. And I think it, it it's important, and like so many of the discussions we've had in COVID calls, it's really also about sort of understanding how we ask deeper questions about how we got to this moment. I, I often find um, it, it, part of it is because people who are in the disaster preparedness realm and the emergency management realm are very busy in a lot of things. And I, I'm afraid there's sometimes a bit of a culture of blaming them for not knowing everything about the whole history of the world. We can divide the labor a little bit. And I think historians like yourself have a real important role to play in helping plug in some of those background pieces so that people know that vulnerability to disaster is itself a historical process. Before I forgot, I wanted to I wanted to told you that I was an undergraduate at the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. And when I was an undergraduate, there was still, a, Walt Rostow still had an office in the history department. And it was explained to me that he was the only person on campus who had three offices, which was more than the president <laughs> had. He kept, an, he kept an office at the LBJ school, he had an office in the economics department, and he had an office in the history department. And he taught a course once in a while, graduate seminar in history, and it was called The Stages of Development. And he had six books and he taught his books and that was it. And that was the 1990s. So at, to your point, that just because certain ideas may seem to be passe at the American Historical Association meeting, it does not mean that they don't have a lot of stickiness in the policy realm. And particularly once they leave the shores and go to other countries and into other realms, they can have a long lifespan, as you pointed out. For sure. You know, one of the things that I always like to point out, particularly to my academic and intellectual friends, actually, is that, um, you know, as intellectuals, we generally speaking like to think of ourselves as producing an idea and then we, we write it down and then we're done with it and we send it out in the world and maybe it's successful and maybe it's not, but you know, then we've set our piece and it goes out there. And we, we tend to valorize people who have original and new ideas. And we, um, we, over, we overextend, I think, and we underestimate uh, the persistence of the old, of the old ideas uh, in general. And, um, how much new ideas uh, take a really long time to to roll out? I mean, you know, in our in as, as historians, as you know, my estimate is it takes usually, even with really successful books, ten or fifteen years before they really reach their kind of uh, maximum influence in 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 in, mo in many fields, and certainly in the history field, right? You know, you think about the really most influential books of say the 1980s or 1990s. Um, uh, you know, they didn't reach that point for a long, long time because it took a while for, you know, enough people had to read them and they had to get onto syllabuses. They had to, right. you know, people, you know, in, in general, that's not how ideas work. Ideas take a long time and then they, and then they stick, right? And so, so I think part of it is, you know, and it's even worse in Silicon Valley, right? Everybody's always interested in innovation all the time. But, you know, I, what I always say is people systematically overvalue the shiny new thing and undervalue the importance of the, you know, the scuffed up old thing. And part of what I think we need to do is we need to spend more time maintaining good ideas, um, not think, thinking we need to reinvent wheels all the time, not thinking that the new thing is always the better thing. Sometimes the old thing is the better thing. And I guess that makes me a conservative at some level. Well, I want to I want to transition into, first of all, let me remind people, we, you're listening to COVID calls. I'm talking to Niles Gilman and we're we're working up to I can't hear you, Scott. the pandemic. You have this, um, you have this piece um, that was published June tenth with can't hear Steve you, Scott. Weber. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, can't hear you. Able to hear me now. So let's try. Let's try that. Able to hear me now, Miles? Let's see if we can just make sure we. Oh, okay. We're going to both try to go off camera and see if we can catch the audio up. Okay, I'm just having a slight technical issue here. Niles, are you able to hear me now? Uh, 
Oh, it looks like we've lost Niles Gilman, but we will come back. And we were just going to shift over. I was going to um, just, I'll just take a second here to remind everybody you're listening to COVID calls. And today my guest is, uh, well, the audience can hear us both. So that's, that's good to know. Um, just getting a little feedback from people who are listening. Um, as I said, with the hurricane, we've got a little bit of uh, a little bit of static here on the line today, coming out of the East Coast. So hopefully, we'll get Niles Gilman right back from the Burke Ruin Institute and listening to COVID calls. Uh, we're just gonna. Um, it looks like he's coming back in now, and we're just gonna try again. Niles, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I I'm can hearing from the audience that audience is able to hear both of us. So maybe as <laughs> so it's okay, <laughs> but um, I was just um, I was just going to uh, shift over and talk about this great piece. So you're um, involved in a publication there called Noema, and and you have a uh, piece that you put out with Stephen Weber on June 10th called "The Long Shot of the Future," um, in which you talk about COVID, the COVID nineteen pandemic, and in lots of fascinating angles on this. And I wish everybody would would check this out. Just go to Noema Mag, N O E M A M A G dot com, and you can check out this great piece. Mm -hmm. And art, there's a part where you where you were just talking about um, the stickiness of ideas, and um, there's a, a quote in there which you talk about the ability to execute. So one of the things that you're talking about with learning from COVID nineteen is the ability to execute become more important than the ability to ideate, which um, is a really kind of fascinating problem we're facing now, that maybe there's uh, this overemphasis on innovation um, and an underemphasis on the ability to do what are often perceived maybe as pretty, pretty boring and banal things like make an emergency plan and execute on the plan. So I wonder if you could talk about Talk about that a little bit, where that idea comes from. I, I think some of us may be uh, worried seeing, but I bring this analytical lens to this problem of too many ideas and not enough operations managers, maybe. <laughs> I don't know how you would put it, but where yeah. does that idea come from? Well, I don't know. I mean, Steve and I have been talking about this for a long time, um, that, uh, you know, the operational competence, part of it is, you know, I spent a, three or four years working at Berkeley. Uh, and watching the way a very large, very old bureaucracy struggled to get certain kinds of basic things done. It was really striking to me um, how difficult things were from an operational perspective. And I don't wanna say it's because people were incompetent. I mean, there's a variation of competence all around, but I, I, I really started thinking about issues of institutional competencies a lot when I was working there. Steve also works at, Ber at Berkeley. Uh, he's the associate dean at the information school now. So he's also sort of got some administrative responsibilities there. Um, and I was also struck, you know, when I was working in Washington and working a lot with military folks at how, uh, how effective a lot of those people are, right? Uh, the military is famously inefficient, but it's also famously effective. Um, you know, uh, you may not, you know, think that the war in Iraq was a good idea. I don't think it was a good idea. I, in fact, I think most of the military planners thought it was a bad idea. Uh, it was the civilians that led us into that. It wasn't the brass who wanted to do it, but they were told, okay, go go knock over Saddam Hussein. And here's a guy who's, you know, got a fairly large military and, you know, and they have to figure out a way to like, you know, get 500,000 troops uh, shipped to the other side of the world in one of the harshest physical environments imaginable with a huge hostile population and how do you chase down, you know, knock over a regime and chase down a guy, right? Like that's not an easy thing to do, right? <laughs> Requires severe competence uh, in order to be able to do that. And, you know, we spent a huge amount of money and there were a lot of deleterious political consequences, many of which I think were predictable. But if you just look at it at a purely sort of military execution perspective, you know, it was pretty effective what they did. Um, and so I've come to appreciate that it's cheap and easy to be an arms, armchair strategist, uh, but it's really hard to actually uh, know how to get things done really effectively. And you know, and that goes across a whole bunch of different things. So you know, when I used to work in industry, in the software industry, you know, I was constantly impressed by you know the kinds of things I saw my 
colleagues who had operational engineering backgrounds, the things that they were able to do were just things that like people like me who work in the realm of ideas have no idea how to get done. They could do a lot more of the things that I do than I could do the things they do. Um, now that's not to say I don't think ideas are important. Obviously I do, otherwise I wouldn't do what I do. Uh, but with that said, I think you know right now, especially because of technological changes, it's really easy for anybody to publish, anybody to have their own radio show, right, Scott? I mean, anybody can do it now. Um, and Absolutely. lots of, and there's lots of brilliant people out there, right? So you know, you're know, you bringing somebody on here every week and it's easy to be blah, 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 but then it's actually executing is what really matters. Like being able to actually execute against problems. And part of the reason why we're seeing such a disaster in the COVID response, I would argue, is that we have as a president now, somebody who's, you know, really good at the blah, blah, blah part of the presidency. He does it, you know, more effectively than anybody else by some measures. But, you know, he's never run anything larger than a 25 person family business. And <coughs> right. that shows. We had uh, an earlier conversation with uh, Peter Shulman, the professor at Ellen, um, and a, a lot of overlap in his area of expertise and with yours. And we were talking about the, um, the various different options that might have been open to the president in March and April. Um, and there was, um, you know, ideas at that time that he could invoke various different kinds of pieces of legislation to, to mass produce, um, uh, you know, whatever equipment might be needed. It was masks and test kits at that time was what we, I guess it's what we still need, frankly. And one of the things that Shulman points out, which is resonating with what you're saying, is that there has been this emphasis on innovation and on investment and on Silicon Valley to the to the expense of just old fashioned kind of operations management stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was theorizing that part of it was in some of it is maybe our distance in time from World War II and, and, and from the Cold War, that some of that may literally be muscle memory that goes away. I think that may be one part of it, but I think maybe you have something else to say about that. I mean, there's other parts of our economy that have kind of replaced, in a sense, it's like if, if our government used to kind of be like the military or like General Motors, what is it like now? Like what have, what models, what mental models have we replaced that with? So and look, I mean, I, yeah. I'm wondering there, about how you think about that. Yeah. I mean, so look, there's some parts of our economy uh, some companies that are incredibly effective. Uh, you know, you think about a company like Walmart or Amazon, right? Um, or General Motors, even now for that matter, right? Um, these are companies that, you know, run incredibly vast global supply chains um, and, you know, have driven costs down enormously, have driven down inventories, have, you know, uh, you know, lower the cost of capital dramatically. I mean, these are incredibly effective companies. I mean, if you're the head of logistics for Walmart, you must be one of the most competent people who's ever walked the face of the earth. I, mean, I don't know who that is, but this, yeah. is, a, this is a person who, you know, can, you know, literally has hundreds of thousands of suppliers and, you know, runs the craziest database of inventory management you can possibly imagine, right? So there are parts of our economy that know how to do it. It's the government that doesn't know how to do it anymore. And this particular challenge, required a specific governmental response. Um, I, have, I have a particular take on this. I mean, I think one thing that's become really, really clear is that it is imperative once you, you know, as we're now eight months into this thing, seven months into this thing, um, that, you know, in a way Trump, was right, but for the wrong reasons as usual. And because he was right for the wrong reasons, he ended up not executing it properly. His initial instinct was let's shut it down, right? Let's shut down all the travel from China, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. uh, and that actually was the correct answer. I mean, that or it was part of the correct answer, right? But actually what we needed to do was shut down all the travel from China and then isolate people who are coming home from China, even Americans, right? You look at what Taiwan did, as soon as they heard the rumor on December 31st, that there was a, a novel coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan. They immediately shut down travel from Wuhan. And then within a couple of days, they'd shut down all the travel to the mainland. This is, the, this is I mean, they have more trade and more travel and they're more sort of, uh, you know, uh, 
tied into the Chinese economy in any any other country in the world, and they were willing to just shut it down, right? And that was, and then they, mm -hmm. and as soon as everybody came in, they were two week quarantines. You know, they track you with your cell phone. If you leave your house, you leave your quarantine site. They're on you right away. This is not optional. We don't make exceptions for people because they're happening to come back from a vacation or whatever. Um, Trump, you know, he was happy to do that to China. He wasn't happy to do that to Europe, right? And in fact, he gave like a two day, three day, four day deadline before doing it. The result is everybody crowded home as quick as they could. I mean, this is insane, right? This yeah, is not left. like, right? Yeah. You know, so, so the res I mean, everybody was crowded into these airports and those became super spreader moments, clearly, right? So, you know, again, because it was motivated by basically a racial animus against the Chinese, he only wanted to do it against the Chinese instead of recognizing the virus does not care at all whether we are white, brown, black, yellow, blue, red, purple, whatever, right? They don't care. You know, we're all just human beings who are susceptible to the virus in exactly the same way. And, uh, you know, there may be some variation based on socioeconomic conditions and underlying conditions and stuff like that. But that, again, has nothing to do with the kinds of things that motivate Donald Trump's animus against the Chinese. And so he had the right instinct, but he executed it wrong because it, the instinct came from a bad place. The you notice in, in this piece that you that you wrote last month that there are certain patterns um, that countries do fall into certain kinds of patterns of, of response and you kind of generalize about those a little bit. You've been talking to us about Taiwan. Can you say a little bit more about that? Like help us um, differentiate a little bit the different patterns you've spotted. Sure, so that actually was where Steve and I first started talking about this because when we, we, we actually wrote the article back in April and didn't appear until early June because of publishing vagaries. Um, but when we when we first wrote the piece, first started thinking about it in, in late March, um, our first question was, yeah, are there political lessons that we can try to draw from the virus uh, and the viral the response to the virus in different countries? And our first initial thing was look at the countries that seem to be worst affected out of the gate. It was obviously China initially, right? Um, Taiwan did relatively well. South Korea did relatively well. Um, Vietnam, I didn't need, no, even know about it. Vietnam arguably has had the single best response, zero deaths, um, even though also being very, obviously shares a border with China. Um, you look at the countries that have done, had done really badly. The US was just beginning to do badly with the time we were writing about this in, in New York. Um, obviously Italy uh, and, and then Spain and then Britain had already turned into total, um, to use a technical term, shit shows. Um, and, uh, you know, so we looked at that and we said, look, there, it doesn't seem, you know, uh, Sweden turned into a total disaster. Norway did reasonably well. So the sort of usual categories that people use to sort of categorize regimes, right? Are they liberal? Are they conservative? Are they authoritarian? Are they democratic? <clears throat> you know, it, it transected it. You had some, you know, authoritarian regimes that did great. You had some democracies that did great. You had some liberal countries that did great. You had some conservative countries that did great and poorly, again, on both sides. Even within Scandinavia, people sometimes talk about a Scandinavian governance model. Well, the Norwegians did great, the, Sweden's, the Swedes did terribly. Yeah. Um, so right. it, 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 the, 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 the level of governmental response, uh, the effectiveness of the governmental response did not seem to us at the time, and I, I, would, consist, I, would, I would say this is still true, to fall along the kinds of divisions that most political scientists, Western political scientists would divide the world up into. So that was sort of the initial insight. What we did look at though, is say it does seem, um, and I think subsequent time has, I think nuanced this a little bit, but it does seem that countries that are committed to a couple of basic principles did seem to do better. So one is countries that had experience looking at emerging new viruses and having an all of government, all of society response for that and had engaged in systematic planning to deal with those kinds of things did much better, right? So specifically, you looked at the countries that had responded effectively to the SARS crisis um, uh, in 2003, seemed to do much, much better than countries that hadn't had that experience. And what we looked at, and we did this case study of Taiwan, is it wasn't just that they had the experience and they sort of had the muscle memory. They'd been continuing to work out the muscles, right? They were doing, you know, whole of healthcare mm -hmm. system drills every couple of years in Taiwan. What happens if there's a new, uh, if there's a new um, virus that emerges, a new respiratory virus that emerges? You know, the whole healthcare system has to switch 
from individual-based care, which is what you do in normal times, you have to declare an emergency and switch over to community-based care. There's a whole bunch of different protocols you have to put into place. And they would basically run a whole of healthcare system drill where they would stack rank the effectiveness of the response of each hospital and give awards and recognition to ones that did well and name and shame the ones that did badly. Well, guess what? If you do that, then people are gonna be ready, right? I mean, the reason why people do rehearsals before you go live on Broadway is because if you rehearse, you're gonna do better when you actually go live. There's a reason why people have practice when they play football or basketball or any other sport. They don't just go and play the games. They have to practice and they you know, work on their fundamentals and they work on their drills. It's not that different. It's about execution, right? And I think one reason why Americans love sports is because we actually appreciate that execution at the end of the day, it's not about whether you can think that you have a better jump shot, is do you hit the jump shot? Right, and in this in this country, mm -hmm. we've just been clanging them off the back of the rim for seven months. And it's it's amazing insight there because it it confounds now how it ties back to some of your earlier work. It really confounds some of these normal metrics we might look to divide the world up into industrialized or non-industrialized, the various different spectrum processes. But but down into this operational level which I imagine emergency managers who are listening to this right now are saying, yeah, exactly. Like we need the resources to like practicing, like making sure we refine our plans and making sure the plans. And this is one of the things I think it, it went flew below the radar that the um, national security council got rid of the pandemic planning task force as if we were never going to have another pandemic in the United States or, or just to become somebody else's problem. Um, but that muscle memory, as you said, it goes away. So I think, you know, I want to go back to something you said earlier. I do think that, you know, now, you know, four months after, I, you know, Steve and I wrote that article, I think we have learned some more things. Um, I think we've learned, you know, if you, there's more data. Um, first of all, we don't really know what's really happened in China. I, I don't put much stock in the d numbers that are coming out of there. We have no real idea what's going on in much of the global South. I mean, what's actually happening in the slums of Mumbai? Who, who, who on earth, who on earth knows, right? Um, we have some idea what's going on in Brazil, but it's only very notional, right? So, um, but one thing that does seem striking now that we have, you know, seven months of data about which countries have done better, is that East Asia in general seems to have done better than the North Atlantic world, United States and Europe um, yeah. among industrialized countries. But I would actually say industrialized countries is the wrong term. You know, there's a debate, and I think there's gonna be a long-term debate about why did East Asia do better? So there's one argument that I've heard many people in East Asia make, which is a kind of a culturalist argument, which is that, you know, there's a Confucian culture that, you know, uh, obeys authority and is therefore willing to take orders and is willing to, you know, put the health and uh, well-being of the collective ahead of the, you know, rights of the individual. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, mm -hmm. there's particularly kind of an authoritarian interpretation of that cultural argument, which you can imagine would be very appealing to the Chinese regime, for example, the mainland Chinese regime. Sure. I'm always skeptical of culturalist arguments. Um, I'm, I'm a materialist by my nature. It's a little bit of a weird thing to be, maybe as an intellectual historian, but um, I tend to think that there may be another explanation. Um, which is that what really matters is something you alluded to earlier, uh, which is industrial capacity. There's a certain kind of discipline that you get if you are making things, right? Going to a factory, right? That requires coordinating a whole bunch of people in a, in a synchronized process. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it's not a creative, you know, creative industries, the kinds of things that, you know, Richard Florida writes about creative types, you know, they're not going to be nearly as good at this kind of mass ex max mass effective operational execution mm -hmm. as people who are used to working mm -hmm. in factories, right? And so the fact that we are a deindustrialized country, um, and that much of Europe, you know, is also deindustrialized, like England, like Sweden, mm -hmm. like Italy, right? It may be that these places, the reason why France, the reason why these places have done worse is because they've lost the industrial culture and the industrial functionality that then allows them to orchestrate themselves as a society to respond effectively to these kinds of challenges. I, you know, that may be very hard to prove and it may be very hard to disentangle the culturalist and the materialist angles and things. I mean, some people might turn around and say, well, the reason why these East Asian countries have been more successful 
at running modern industrial plants is because they have this culture which allows them to work in factories more effectively. I would also reject that, but maybe we're going down a rat hole. That's a, a, a fascinating premise. It sounds like the kind of premise that's exactly as you said, people are gonna be trying to, to work out um, in the years to come and just getting the data to try to, I mean, how many people actually have been sick in China? I mean, it also presents kind of problem as we try to generalize about some of these about some of these places but it also points to another point you make in the piece which i think is a really important one and you you come to this i quote because it's a good quote you said um what the covid 19 pandemic is revealing in stark terms is the limits of the individualist model of risk allocation so not just individualism, as we might think of individualism as a sort of, you know, sacrosanct aspect of American life, but individualism, as we think about how risk is apportioned across society. There's a ton of discussion about this right now in America around healthcare, around um, blood insurance, however you want to cut it. We're always trying to figure out how to deal with the social contract on one, my right not to wear a mask on the other hand. And you, you layer that into this piece. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that because maybe we can read that back on South Korea and Taiwan. It might be fascinating to read that back into your sort of East Asia premise there a little bit. Yeah, so um, the we I don't think we mentioned Ulrich Beck, the German so, late German sociologist in the piece, but Ulrich Beck is, um, his thinking is hanging heavily over this. He made a, argument back in the 1990s that we were moving uh, into what he called a risk society and that the primary political divisions in society uh, would be would turn on debates about how risk should be allocated and shared or not. And I think this is a quite prophetic argument um, that Beck made back in the 1990s. Um, and I think we're seeing much of what appears to be a culture war on many fronts in this country is really fundamentally a debate over how risk should or should not be shared. And I think the pandemic has starkly revealed that people have different both risk appetites um, and different willingnesses to make individual sacrifices in exchange for mitigating collective risk. Um, you know, the argument about herd immunity um, that was, you know, first put out by Boris Johnson um, is really an argument about who should bear the risks, right? It's saying, look, you know, this is mainly going to affect, um, you know, it's mainly going to kill apparently old people. Um, you know, the Swedes made this argument extremely explicitly uh, that, you know, look, w why should all these young people have their lives ruined? Uh, because, you know, some old people who are probably going to die in a couple of years anyways, die a couple of years sooner. Right. And, you know, given the way the con current conservative government in Britain is, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them, you know, behind closed doors snickered and said, hey, guess what? It'll also help drive down costs on the national pension system. Right. So, you know, right. those are those are like arguments, um, you know, and you can talk about the history of eugenics and so on and so forth, which are also arguments about how should risk, you know, and biological risk in particular be shared and allocated. And what are the kinds of responsibilities that individuals have to the collective? And the argument that Steve and I make in this piece is that we have had over the last 40 years in this country, a really huge ideological push to push risk out of collective pools and onto individuals. And there's a whole bunch of arguments, some of which are not unreasonable for why this should be the case, right? One is about giving people individual choice. Another one, um, you know, if you manage your own risks, you know your own risk preferences better. We shouldn't assume that everybody has the same risk preferences. Some people may be willing to take on more risks for all sorts of reasons than others, and we shouldn't impose that kind of consumer choice on everybody uniformly. There's also an argument about moral hazard, that if you protect people from, uh, you know, risks, uh, then they will engage in more high risk behavior. So they won't protect themselves as much. This is a common thing in you know, insurance schemes. Um, it's one of the reasons why you know, they, insurance companies, for example, will try to, uh, you know, will penalize you if you uh, get speeding tickets, right? Um, or they'll want to inspect your house if they are willing to give you, you know, fire insurance uh, and so on. And yet we do require some kinds of insurance in this country, right? Um, the, tr the truth is you have to have third party insurance to drive a car. You're required, I think, in almost every jurisdiction in this country to have 
uh, fire insurance for your home. So we do have some areas where we continue to insist that regardless of your preference, you have to have insurance of some sort or another. Um, and, uh, and the question is whether we've drawn the line in the right place. And I would argue that we haven't, right? I mean, part of the argument around Medicare for all, for example, or various kinds of universal healthcare schemes is that that's not a risk we should be trading on. People shouldn't have to make individual choices around ri risks of that sort. And in fact, people don't have dramatically different preference sets around whether or not they want to be healthy. People more or less all want to be healthy the same way, right? And the notion that people are gonna drink less or smoke less because they have or don't have insurance is not borne out by an iota of data. So mm -hmm. part of our argument is that the COVID pandemic now has brought into sharp relief that there are these strong divisions around uh, how risk should be allocated and shared and the costs of the kind of risk regime we live under today have become starkly apparent, right? And you know, there's 157,000 dead Americans so far yeah. because we want to have one kind of risk allocation, and there's seven dead dead Taiwanese because they want to have a different kind of risk allocation. I want to um, first of all note that in 97 episodes of COVID calls, this is the first time Ulrich Beck has come up which I have restrained, which, which anybody who knows me means that's been extraordinary restraint on my part. And in <laughs> fact, I just saw um, that Adam Tooz has a piece up about Ulrich Beck in, in foreign policy up right now, called the sociologist who could save us from coronavirus. So I don't think there's a little, there's a little micro Beck moment happening right now. We've got a nice question here from Jorge Benavides, who's a loyal listener to COVID calls. I wonder what you think about this. Um, Niles, this again, sort of coming to these notions about maybe how if, if, if more collectivist culture or what I might call a stronger social contract um, can be layered into this notion of risk society that Beck was was thinking about. Does that does that resonate for you at all? I think so. I mean, look, there's a huge academic literature and debate uh, about the relationship between um, homogeneity in a country and the willingness to share risks. Um, and homogeneity across a bunch of different levels. The more uh, inequality there is economically, the less willingness there is to do risk sharing, particularly for the wealthy. Um, the more racial division there is in general, the less uh, risk sharing there is. Um, you know, the more, if there's nationality differences, linguistic differences, diversity is hard uh, you know, it, it cuts against solidarity. Uh, and that's not something that, um, you know, liberals particularly like to hear, but it's true. Uh, diversity is just harder to manage. And anybody who's worked in a really diverse environment knows, and I, I'm, I'm absolutely in favor of diversity, don't get me wrong, but to say that there's no cost associated with that is just not true. Um, people will fundamentally be willing to share more risks with people they feel more in common with, right? And we all think about this ranging just from like, you're willing to share more risks with your individual family than you are with your next door neighbor, even if you really love your next door neighbors. Um, and mm -hmm. you know what's true for co-sanguinity is also true for you know, wider senses of identity, uh, whether those are class identity or racial identity or national identity. That's um, you know, pulling that idea back into some of this problem of, of how you operationalize you know, preparing for a pandemic um, and how we think about emergency management more, more directly, um, it again, to me, shows the imperative that we bring these sort of historical and cultural layers to bear on emergency management plans, which somehow maybe don't even treat culture and they treat a city as a series of zones with emergency operation centers. And again, this is in no criticism of emergency managers um, who, have a job to play. They got to save people and they got to save as many as they can in a short period of time. But I think we've evolved a system which comes out of the Cold War again, a sort of command and control system that divides the country up into a series of sort of military zones that say, this is what's going to happen in a disaster and everybody's going to follow the rules. And the various things you're talking about, just like this risk allocation problem, it's culturally formed, it's produced. It's, it's not something that's found in the world, we make it through our everyday interactions in our economy, in our culture, and in our politics. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think in the United States, we're a much less, let's say, obedient culture than we used to be. Um, and, you know, it's funny, I, I, I just was watching uh, a couple of interesting movies from the uh, 1950s. One was a, a feature film 
a, a monster feature film called Them about a giant um, ant invasion of Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, cl a classic piece of sort of Cold War sci-fi horror. Um, and then I was also watching videos of the Stanley Milgram experiments, which were taking place in Connecticut uh, in the uh, late 1950s mm -hmm. and early 1960s. And one thing that's really striking is the way in which scientists had this kind of, people would defer, you know, you just see in these, in these representations of scientists, both in the, the real life scientists um, in Stanley Milgram, who tell people, keep shocking those guys and people will obey, right? Um, to the point where like, you know, they, they seem to be killing these people, but the scientists are saying, don't worry, follow my orders. And the same thing in this movie, Them, right? There are these scientist characters who basically are able to cow everybody by saying, I'm a scientist, do what I say, right? And people, you know, people can talk about the death of expertise, but there's also the death of deference in general. Um, and while the death of expertise is a bummer, I'm not so sure that most of the time we don't think that the death of deference to authority figures isn't basically a good thing. I mean, why should we automatically defer to, you know, the old white guy in a lab coat? Um, and, you know, but I think that the cost of that, the cost of that loss of deference is also becoming apparent now. People are, you know, thinking that like, you know, what being American, what being a free American means is being able to do whatever the hell you want to do. And it doesn't matter if the governor tells you to do something else and the public health officials tell you to do something else and your neighbors ask you to do something else. You can do whatever the hell you want. And, you know, th you know, that's a, that's an almost nihilistic version of what you think freedom is, right? Um, but it's, I think, become much, much more pre prevalent. That idea of what freedom is, is the freedom to do whatever the hell you want, um, has become much more prevalent in the United States over the last 50 to 75 years. And that just makes it way harder, obviously, to, for the authority figures to command uh, an effective response. I mean, the truth is, another thing that cuts against politics, right? You know. There's been a festival of hypocrisy among political pundits in blaming and in trying to assign blame for the pandemic. The truth is that there is no state, not a blue governor, not a red governor, not a blue state, not a red state, that's had a really effective pandemic response. And it's really, really tried to enforce quarantine and stay at home orders. Right. And what I mean by that is, you know, in, you know, in the, in the, in the Sun Bible Belt across the South, you know, people have, you know, they want to go to church. And so they, then the governors are not going to go against church going people because that's political suicide to like go against church going people. And for the most part, they haven't tried to shut down any of those places. They said, don't do it. You know, uh, they've admonished people. They've asked, you know, ministers to do things virtually. And a lot of ministers have, thankfully, but some of them haven't. And when they haven't, there's been no consequences. In blue states, you know, the governor's have you know responded to you know protesters in the street on mass for the you know movement for Black Lives, and they haven't wanted to shut that down because that would be politically suicidal for them. And you know your mileage may vary about whether you think each of those is worthwhile doing, but the truth is the political leaders have not even tried to enforce the kinds of rules we would need to enforce if we really wanted to stop the virus in its tracks. We haven't even tried, and the reason why the political leaders haven't tried is because they know that fundamentally large numbers of people don't want them to try. All right. Mm -hmm. So I don't totally blame our political That's, leaders. I want to remind people you're listening to COVID calls and talking with Miles Gilman today about lots of different issues, all of which sort of revolving around what's happening with democracy in the midst of COVID. And I want to come to the election. I know you're part of a project that has a report. I'm not sure if it's been made public, um, mm -hmm. the Transition Integrity project and maybe you can tell us where to find it. But I was thinking about, uh, we've had a lot of elections in American history in the midst of disasters, uh, 68, 1932, 1864, and others. Um, and this is gonna be one of those. And um, so we're worried, we're worried about a lot of things. People are gonna show up, what's gonna happen with mail-in voting. There've been a lot of think pieces some thinkier than others about whether or not Trump will barricade himself in the Oval Office if he loses. I, I don't find those scenarios too interesting. I, I, but the disinformation scenarios, I had Starbird on yesterday from the University of Washington and some of the disinformation campaign stuff she was talking about, I could not sleep last night. So what have you been doing with this project? What kind of scenarios are you, are you worried about? What is on your mind with this? 
Sure. So uh, the Transition Integrity Project uh, was something I started with um, Rosa Brooks of Georgetown uh, Law Center uh, back in December. Um, and basically what we did was we um, put together a series of four uh, scenario simulations, um, war games as they're known, um, that uh, gamed out four post-electoral scenarios. So we were not looking at what was happening on election day. I and mean, there's lots of people worried about potential disruptions that could happen on election day, ranging from, you know, a cyber attack on our, on our voting infrastructure uh, to a blackout to, you know, direct, you know, putting uh, federal forces on the streets to intimidate voters and so on and so forth. Like there's a bunch of things that people are thinking about, about what could happen on election day. We were mainly focused on what would happen, what could potentially happen between the day after the election, so November 4th, and January 20th. Um, now, initially, the things that um, we were most concerned with had to do actually with how do we maintain administrative continuity in order to be able to maintain the same kind of operational competence, right? Uh, there are thousands and thousands of political appointees, and in a normal uh, process, so when you know uh, Obama took over from Bush, for example, uh, you know, there's a, there's a very formalized process that the previous administration basically passes batons to the next uh, administration so that all the political appointees are getting pre-briefings so that they can hit the ground running at full speed when they come into office on January 20th. And a big part of what's supposed to take place between January, between election day and January 20th is precisely all of those meetings of all of the people from the outgoing administration, meeting with all the people from the ingoing administration, telling them where the files are, what are the big problems they're working on. And, you know, the federal bureaucracy is vast, right? And so, you know, everything from, you know, Bureau of Land Management issues to, um, you know, the Nuclear National Security Administration to, you know, various things in the Defense Department to the Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, you know, all the different federal bureaucracies, they all had political appointees in them, and we want to make sure that there's continuity. And we were really worried that that might not happen this year for all sorts of reasons. Um, and not even because mm -hmm. Trump would necessarily try to directly sabotage that process, but more because he might not even know how to do it. Like, you know, there was not a normal transition in 2016 because even though the Obama people had prepared all of these dossiers that were ready to go to either the Hillary team or the Trump team, depending on which one of them won, and they were ready to go, Trump didn't show up to most of those things. Part of the reason why they tossed out the, uh, the pandemic preparedness plan is that, you know, they actually did run something there, but half the people who were involved in the little simulation of a pandemic in January, 2017, were fired by Trump within the first year. There was no continuity of operational competence. So he's, he wasn't even worried about operational competence for his own administration. So the notion that he's gonna be really concerned with making sure that things are gonna be awesome for Joe Biden when he comes in and that it's gonna be really efficient seemed a little bit implausible to me and Rosen. So initially we were concerned about operational disruptions during a transition process should Biden win. But then as we started talking to more people about this, we realized that's not the only kind of mischief that an incumbent president can get up to during this period. You know, America has a very unusual political system. In most parliamentary systems, for example, if there's an election and the incumbent party loses, they're out of office. So in Britain, you know, if the, you know, sitting prime minister, when Gordon Brown loses the election um, to Cameron, he leaves 10 Downing Street that day and He's Cameron off. moves in yeah. moves in the next day, right? And the reason why there's a right. shadow cabinet for the, uh, you know, the, uh, the out of power party is so that they're ready to move into power right away, right? And they're meeting with their counterparts so that they can have this administrative continuity as the government switches from one to the other. We haven't done it that way. And we have this interregnum, but that assumes that there's good faith willingness on both sides to ensure that there's going to be operational continuity, right? And by all reports, for example, the Bush administration did a great job briefing the Obama people. Obviously when we were in the middle of a terrible crisis then, you know, there was a you know financial meltdown that was sure. happening and so on. And everybody says on the Obama side, on the Bush side, that that was incredibly smooth, that the Obama people totally respected that it was one government at a time. They weren't going to take over making the decisions until January 20th, but they were being read into all the decisions that the Bush team was making so they could understand the logic on that. And that, you know, provided the ability for the Obama team to hit the ground running in, in 2009, in January 2009. This time around, I'm not so sure that it's going to work that way, right? Um, so one of the things you realize is that the incumbent president has 
even if he's lost, still has control over the federal bureaucracy or in principle has control over the federal bureaucracy. And there's all sorts of things that a president who's uninhibited either by norms and decency on a personal level or by his own political party on the other side is able to do. Um, you know, we've already seen what the limits on this are, right? So Trump, you know, earlier, you know, uh, late last week, made up some nonsense about how he wanted to postpone the election, right? Um, and there was immediate pushback from McConnell and from lots of Republicans who said, that's not true. Only Congress has the right to postpone the election. We're not going to do that. And that was good that they said that, right? There was some pushback from the Republicans that, you know, mm -hmm. that, yeah, forget it. We're not going to do that, right? So it shows they are willing to set some limits. But that also makes it really striking that when he says other things and they don't push back, you now know what kinds of limits they're not going to put on him, right? So we can read by negative inference that, for example, him wanting to totally mess up the post office, you don't hear a lot of Republicans complaining about that. Him saying we should count all the ballots, only count the ballots that are available on the night of, January, of November 3rd. Well, why would he want to do that? Why would he say that and get no pushback from Republicans? Well, the reason is, is that most of the votes that come in provisionally or come in late break Democratic. And there's a, this is called the right. blue shift. It's a well-known thing among uh, political scientists who study elections. There's a bunch of reasons for it. And the blue shift is likely to be even more pronounced this year because a lot of people will vote mm -hmm. with provisional ballots or vote absentee late in the day. They're going to wait to see whether they can vote uh, in person and they're going to see what the COVID situation is. And we know that Democrats um, are more concerned about COVID risk than Republicans are. And so they're probably going to be more concerned about voting, more likely to take the voting late option, mail in, you know, the day before, mail stuff in. Um, so, you know, if, if he tries to shut down and declare that whatever the votes are that are counted that night are the only ones that count, that's definitely going you know, to advantage him, right? Or, you know, we've seen that he's willing to send troops into, uh, you know, send federal forces, not troops, and they're not military. He tried the military initially in Lafayette Square, got some pushback, so he didn't yeah. do that. But then when he used DHS forces, he didn't get any pushback, right? Right. He got pushback from the local right. government, right? But didn't get pushback from... <clears throat> Uh, Republicans anywhere, right? So where do you say he's going to redeploy the troops? He's pulled out of Portland. Well, now where is he redeploying them? He said, he's announced already that he's going to deploy them to Cleveland, Detroit, mm -hmm. and Milwaukee. Well, what are Cleveland, Detroit, and Milwaukee? They are the big blue cities in three critical swing states, right? And so why would he do that? Well, because, you know, he can declare emergency powers, right? Um, and potentially use the emergency powers to shut, you know, create a curfew that could extend into election day. And it's just too bad that these people are rioting, you know, in uh, in these cities and we have to shut them down. We're not discriminating against the Democrats, but people in Republican cities and out in the countryside, they don't riot. Well, you combine that with people who are known to be agent provocateurs, and this has already been shown to have happened in, uh, in places like Maryland, in places like Minnesota, right? Uh, where we know that there were uh, boogaloo boy types who were pretending to be Antifa types, creating violence, which then becomes an excuse that can be used for bringing in troops into these into these cities, right? So, you know, so these are the kinds of scenarios we gamed out in these uh, in the Transition Integrity Project. We ran actually four scenarios based on four different electoral outcomes: one based on Biden winning in a landslide, one based on Trump winning pretty clearly, one based on Biden winning by a hair of his chin, and one based on a truly ambiguous result. Um, and, you know, we had, we recruited a bipartisan group of people. There's about uh, over a hundred people. It included as pretty senior level people. It included um, people like, uh, you know, former vice presidential chief of staff, Bill Crystal, who's a Republican, um, former Republican National Committee chairman, Michael Steele, um, former Bush speechwriter David Frum. So those are sort of prominent Republicans mm -hmm. who were involved. We also had prominent Democrats who were involved. John Podesta, who used to be chief of staff to Clinton, Bill Clinton. Um, we had, uh, you know, Jennifer Granholm, who was the governor of a swing state, Michigan. Um, so we, you know, recruited people and these people then played different roles. They played the Biden campaign or they played the Trump campaign or they played Democratic elected officials in Washington or Republican elected officials in Washington. And then the game was meant to simulate how the different moves that the different teams would make would dynamically interact with each other and potentially produce right. a series of pretty catastrophic outcomes. And what we found was in three of the four games we ran, in every scenario except for the scenario where Biden won in a landslide, we ended up with huge numbers of people coming into the streets, clashing forces between right-wing and left-wing protesters, 
major amounts of political violence um, and electoral contestation that lasted right into January and the results uh, not being uh, clear um, and competing narratives. And this is to your point about the possibilities for disinformation. Trump doesn't actually have to win. Arguably, you could say Biden doesn't actually have to win. They just have to create a plausible narrative that the other side stole it from them, right? right. And you see Trump in particular already setting that narrative up. He's saying, you know, the, the vote by mail is going to be fraudulent, right? And so that is a way for him to precede the idea that if we count all these absentee ballots, that that somehow is going to, and the absentee ballots are what swing the election against him in a few key states, that that is going to prove that these people stole it from him, right? Um, and, you know, and if he wins, well, he won despite the fact that the Democrats were trying to steal the election. Right. So these are all significant concerns. And so we're raising the, you know, raising the alarm now because there's lots of things that can be done in advance, we believe, to mitigate some of those risks. Um, you know, individual citizens, I think, can do things like, A, call up their legislature legislators um, and insist that everybody who wants to vote should be enabled to do so and every vote that gets cast should right. be counted, right? Uh, call your congressperson, call your legislature, your legislator, call your governor, insist on that. Um, if it turns out that that's not being done, be prepared to take to the streets in peaceful protest, know how to be disciplined about pe being peaceful, not allow anybody to engage in violence on your side because it'll delegitimate your cause. So these are all things that citizens can do. There's right. also things that I think you know, people in government positions can do. So one thing I would love to see, for example, would be in swing states where there are a split government. So for example, in North Carolina, Wisconsin, Michigan, where you have a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature, they should get together now and, and write down an agreement that's bipartisan about how the process is going mm -hmm. to work, right? In case there's a disputed process, write it down in advance before the process happens, right? Have a public... Uh, declaration of these things. Be transparent. Explain how the vote counting is going to take place. Communicate now that it's not going to be decided on election night, probably. We're going to need to be patient. We're going to need to wait maybe as long as a week or even two weeks in some places to get all the votes counted because of the slowdown with the mail. And that There's going to be so many provisional ballots, so many mail-in ballots, unprecedented numbers. So there's lots of things that can be done at that level as well. And finally, I think that things can be done in Washington, right? There can be a real insistence that this not, you know, not be derailed. There can be oversight that can be imposed, uh, you know, on potential, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and make it clear that if people in the administrative parts of the government are complicit with an attempt to subvert our democracy, there will be consequences for them, uh, right. including possibly criminal consequences, right? I mean, if you if you been complicit in an effort to use the levers of government to abuse power to, you know, disrupt the democratic process in this country, my belief is that there should be a very severe penalty, uh, certainly for your career as a politician, uh, but possibly even uh, in other forms as well. Niles Gilman talking about the Transition Integrity Project, one of the things that keeps him busy this year, this year of COVID-19, and as you were laying out those many different scenarios, I, I'd just remind people, you can find that report. All of the major media outlets are carrying the report. You can you can get that, or you can email me directly. I'm assuming you can email Niles at the Berger Institute if you want to get that. Read it, and I particularly like the fact that you laid out the scenarios, but that you also have very concrete actions that people can take now. And I think in a year in which so much of what's happened feels disempowering, the murder of George Floyd, COVID-19, the economic collapse, we need as many empowering things on our scratch pads as possible right now so that we don't feel like this disaster compounds to the point where we're all just crushed by it. And we're almost up on time, but I just wanted to, as you were talking, it also made me think, I can't think of a time when we worried so much about that interregnum period. You know, 100,000 or more Americans could die of COVID-19 between November and January. Absolutely. I mean, and who wants to, this is sort of, maybe a bad formulation of this old saw, but you know, who wants to be the last man to die in Vietnam? I mean, who wants to be the last person to die under, you know, a failed pandemic response? And it may very well be, as you described, that the Trump, there's no, there's no evidence that I can see that the Trump administration will try to make things at HHS better between November and January for an incoming 
Biden team. But but I think and um, I want to think more about when we can talk again as we get a little closer to the election. Maybe there are things that citizens can demand, no matter who's elected, between November and January, that there have to be some guarantees that the government doesn't just even further wash its hands of what already is a completely failed response. Now, so I'm going to give you the last word on that, and then we're going to we're going to wrap it up. Well, I mean, amen. Basically, I think I I, I do. I'm not trying to be a Cassandra here. I'm trying to give people tools to actually do things that are positive. I'll just leave with, with one kind of maybe meta thought about the Transition Integrity Project and how it relates to COVID, um, just kind of cognitively. You know, when Rose and I were first talking about this, and the reason why we decided we wanted to do um, scenarios was that scenarios are a way to get people to imagine and inhabit a world um, at a kind of a visceral level that uh, they might not otherwise be able to find believable. Uh, the reason why we wanted to do this is because we were talking to lots of people last fall about the possibility of a disruptive transition. And most people were like, nah, that'll never happen. Don't worry about that. You're totally paranoid, Nils, totally paranoid, Rosa. So we were like, you know, our hair was on fire. We're like, we got to do something to shock people out of this. And that's why we came up with this scenario approach, which is a classic um, tool that's used to help people sort of uh, understand at a kind of experiential level. I mean, what I always say is it's the difference between reading about going to Paris and actually going to Paris. It's not the same experience, right? So we want people to inhabit that, these possible worlds. Of course, when we started planning that back in December and January, we had no idea that COVID was coming. Um, and one of the uh, effects, the kind of mass psychological effects of COVID has been that people now are really, really easy to convince about really scary long tail risks, that they should at least take those things seriously. Um, people have, you know, everything that's happened in the last, you know, uh, five months especially is making people, uh, priming people to take really low probability but high negative impact events seriously. And I think that part of the reason why there's been a lot of interest in the Transition Integrity Project results is because, as I say, I think that, you know, there's a sort of mass priming to take these kinds of possibilities seriously. And even if it's not like, you know, a super high probability event that some of these worst case things could happen, we don't want to be caught flat footed on these things the way we were caught flat footed with COVID. Well, tomorrow on COVID calls, I'm gonna be talking to Joshua Baer and we Yusuf about hurricane evacuation and compound disasters in the midst of the pandemic. These are uh, researchers who are involved in the National Science Foundation funded Converge project, which runs out of the University of Colorado Boulder. Really look forward to talking with them and a tremendous uh, discussion. Niles Gilman of the Bergruen Institute, thank you so much for your time and insights today. And again, to remind people um, to check out his many publications and this most recent one in Noema, the long shadow of the future, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed how valuable it is for governments to have operational expertise, plan for long-term and socialize certain risks. Niles, I hope to get you back. Thanks a million for coming on today. Thanks so much for having me, Scott. It's been a pleasure. Stay healthy, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow.